Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Get Ready for Game Night, my YouTube channel where I try to teach you some of my favorite games in a very casual, unscripted way, just as though you're sitting right here at the table. Um, I've gotten a few requests on my channel to do the expansions to War of the Ring, so I'm going to try to tackle that today. Today we're going to be teaching you how to play The Lords of Middle-Earth, the first expansion to War of the Ring. I will point out that since my last video I have received the Anniversary Edition of War of the Ring, which are the boxes you see in the background. So the board is going to be bigger, the pieces are going to be painted, it's going to look a lot nicer. Uh, keep in mind if you have the base game of War of the Ring or the regular expansion for Lords of Middle-Earth, it won't look quite as elaborate. But let's get right to it. Here you see everything that you get in the Lords of Middle-Earth expansion. It basically adds Lords of Middle-Earth. You're going to have new characters to play with. It adds a lot of new event cards, alternate uh, companion cards, new dice, new ways to use the Elven Rings. And we'll go through all of this in detail. But I just wanted to give you a shot uh, right up front of basically what you get in the box. One of the first things you do when setting up a game with the new Lords of Middle-Earth expansion is you add these additional event cards to the deck. Each side will get two additional army event cards and four additional character event cards. In addition, you're going to replace one card in the game. The normal base game card, Balrog of Moria, which is card number 17 of the uh, character deck, is going to be replaced. You take this out of the game and you replace it with a Balrog is Come. Simply take all these cards, shuffle them up in their respective decks. The game comes with these four Smeagol Hunt Tiles. At the beginning of the game, you're going to take two of them, you'll note they look like regular Hunt Tiles on the back, and put them in the Hunt Pool. The other two are set aside, they may come into play later in the game. One small change when setting up the game is you can now choose to start with either Strider or Gandalf the Grey as the leader to the Fellowship right off the bat at the beginning of the game. And in fact, if you choose Gandalf the Grey, you can choose which version of Gandalf the Grey you want to be the leader. One of the cool things they did in this expansion is they gave you a purely cosmetic upgrade. Uh, here we see Gandalf the Grey and uh, Strider, uh, which are the pieces that start the game. And normally you just put a little token underneath them when they get upgraded to Gandalf the White and heir to Isildur. But here, they actually give you a replacement miniature. So now when Gandalf the White comes out, he comes out riding Shadowfax. And uh, heir to Isildur, also he's now mounted because he's a little more powerful. Purely cosmetic, doesn't affect gameplay, but just a nice touch. So the biggest difference, in my opinion, to the game with the Lords of Middle-Earth expansion are these new dice that you can roll called Keeper Die. If you're the Shadow Player, the die are called Lesser Minion Dice. And if you're the Free People's Player, they're called something else. I think they're called um, Keepers of the Elven Ring Dice. But they're Keeper Dice. And every one of these characters has a special set of rules required to get them into play and they're explained in detail on the back side of their character cards. But one of the things that it's going to grant you is once these characters are in play, you will get to roll their die in addition to your regular action dice. There are a few changes, however. You'll notice these dice have some symbols that aren't on the normal dice. You have this symbol here. You'll see this symbol looks like a set of cards, and what that basically means is when you spend this die, you get to draw one card into your hand from either of your decks. You also are going to have, with the Balrog, a new symbol that will allow you to move the Balrog or activate the Balrog. And what those mean are explained in detail on his card. Now, no matter how many of these dice you've earned, when you do your action roll, you can only choose one of them to use on that turn. So the sequence is you roll all of your dice, including any keeper dice that you may have accumulated, but then before you spend any of them, you have to declare which one you're going to keep this round. The other two are just removed for the rest of the round. Now, 
you'll also notice that some of these dice have little stars on them. That one's not very easy to see. But for instance, here's an army die, the flag, and it has a little star on it. The star is the means by which the dice can leave the game because these dice are not necessarily permanent. Um, every die can leave the game in a special way, but for the most part, the Free People's Keeper die, once Gandalf the White has entered play, if you choose to spend one of your Keeper die that has a star, then at the end of that round, that die will go away. And the same holds true, more or less, for the Shadow Player's dice. Um, if you spend a die that has a star on it after the Witch King has come into play, then that die is going to go away. Now right here you'll notice that even though these are dice that belong to the Free Peoples, they have the I symbol on it, basically representing that using the Elven Rings is dangerous and it makes the Fellowship more vulnerable to the hunt. So if these results are ever rolled, and or more likely you only have one of these die and that's the result you rolled, well guess what? It immediately goes into the hunt box, just like any other die that gets rolled with an eye. And in fact, if you're rolling all three of these and one of them happens to be an eye, well, the decision's made for you. That die is the one you're using and it has to go into the hunt box. One way that all of the keeper die can be eliminated is if their character is eliminated. And their characters are eliminated in the same way that uh, characters or companions have been eliminated. Basically, if you wipe out an army that they're associated with, that character leaves the game, and their die would leave the game as well. That applies to all the characters and all the dice. In addition to giving you the keeper die with each character, every character also grants you a few bonuses, especially in the realm of combat. For instance, Elrond here, each elven elite unit in the same region with Elrond is also considered to be a leader for all combat purposes. So having elites really makes uh, Rivendell hard to conquer because Elrond can never leave Rivendell. Same with Lady Galadriel. She can never leave Lorien. And she has the uh, ability that she can recruit in Lorien even if it's under siege. So if Lorien's under siege, you can still buff your troops there if Lady Galadriel is there. And I think we already talked about Gandalf the Grey being able to um, activate uh, any nation and immediately bring it to war if you use his special die, um, his elven ring, I should say, when he is in one of those free people's regions. Let's talk about the lesser minions of the shadow. Gothmog, Lieutenant of Morgul, and the Balrog of Moria. Those are just fun to say. Um, Gothmog and the Balrog are both brought into play, meeting some pretty easy requirements, and the use of a mustard die will bring them out. You get their special die and the powers that go with them. For instance, Gothmog, if he's with a shadow army, you can use a muster action die to recruit one regular unit to that army or upgrade one regular unit to an elite unit uh, as long as they're in a free area. So you can recruit units and upgrade units outside of shadow strongholds, um, making him a very military-focused character. The Balrog is a little different. Um, the Balrog starts in Moria and normally can't leave Moria. And you get this little oops, activation counter to represent that his level is zero initially. But he can be activated to bring his level up to two, allowing him to leave Moria. Now, his special abilities are kind of cool. The Fire and Shadow ability, you get to draw a hunt tile if the Fellowship was revealed or declared and as a result has moved through, from, or into any region uh, that has the Balrog. So basically, he's just an automatic draw from the hunt bag. And also, if he is in battle, you add two to the combat strength of the Shadow Army. 
and you can still only roll a maximum of five dice. Now, using the Balrog can be a little bit dangerous in that if during that free draw that they get, if the Free People's player is declared or discovered and they move through the Balrog, if you draw a regular eye token from the hunt bag, well, then guess what? Both the Balrog and whoever is the leader of the Fellowship at that moment is immediately killed and removed from the game. Uh, there's also a way for the Free People's player to inactivate the Balrog, uh, basically pinning him down. Basically, they can use either a Will of the West uh, action that would immediately deactivate the Balrog, or you can use a character action die if Gandalf, and that's any version of Gandalf, is in the same region of the Balrog. And if he's ever made inactive outside of Moria, then he leaves the game. That's the way that the uh, Free People's player can get the Balrog out of the game. Also, once the Balrog is active and he rolls the Balrog face on the action die, uh, you can use that to do one of the following things. You can move an army with the Balrog or attack with an army with the Balrog or just move the Balrog at his, assuming he's active, um, his uh, two spaces. The second component that this expansion adds to the base game is now the Elven Rings each have unique abilities. You can still use them to just change a die result to anything you want that's not a Will of the West. Um, so these would actually be gone and you just have these when you're playing with them. But now, again, they're one-time uses. Each one represents a ring that is held by one of the Lords of Middle-earth, either Elrond, Galadriel, or Gandalf. And, for example, you could use Gandalf's ring, Narya, uh, instead of just to change a die result. Now, if Gandalf is in a free people's nation that hasn't been conquered by the Shadow Player, you can use this ring, Narya, to, along with any die, a die of your choice, to immediately bring that nation all the way to war. You activate the nation and bring them all the way to war with a single die along with this ring. Now you still flip it over and then give it to the shadow player and they can use it the way they always have. Um, Lady Galadriel, her ring is called, uh, what was it called? Nenya. And if during the course of the game the shadow draws a hunt tile and it is a standard eye, then, and you don't want to take that hit, um, you can use Galadriel's ring to say, no, nope, take that eye tile uh, completely out of the game. It doesn't go back in the bag to come out later when you're on the track of Mount Doom. It is completely out of the game. And you just draw another tile instead and apply its effects. So very powerful. And arguably the most powerful one, Elrond, um, Vilya, the elven ring, when... Uh, you use that ring to basically double down on an action die. So if, we've, if we're saying, yep, we've, here's our four dice at the beginning of the game or whatever, and I want to use this, uh, this character die, but, uh, man, I really wish I had another character die. Guess what? Boom. Now you do. So basically you use a die expend its effects, everything happens, then you flip over the Elrond ring, you get that die back as though you never spent it, but all the effects carry through. So those are the new ways you can use the Elven rings with Lord, the Lords of Middle-earth expansion. Now, there are a few restrictions as to when and how you can use these new upgraded Elven rings. First of all, before you can use the Elrond Elven ring, well, you have to bring the character of Elrond into the game. And that will also bring into the game his corresponding action die. Yeah, I believe, believe it's that one. Um, and the same holds true to you have to have gotten Lady Galadriel into the game along with her action die and the special version of uh, Gandalf the Grey and his action die. Those characters have to be active and in the game in order to use the special abilities of these rings. 
You can always use the ability to just change a regular die result. But in order to do the special abilities we just talked about, those characters have to be in play. Now, the other restriction is, these new dice that are introduced in this expansion are called keeper dice. Uh, they're the dice that you get to roll in addition to your regular dice during the action roll. You are not allowed to use one of the elven rings to change the result of a keeper die. Uh, and those are the restrictions for using the new elven ring counters. Now let's talk about the character Smeagol. Smeagol is an alternate form of Gollum, and if you remember from the books or the movie, he sort of was a bit bipolar or schizophrenic. There were times when he was helping the Fellowship and times when he was their worst enemy. The way the Lord of the Rings, uh, I'm sorry, the Lord of Middle-earth expansion incorporates this is by adding those Smeagol tiles, you remember those, to the hunt bag right at the beginning. If one of these tiles is ever drawn out of the hunt bag during the hunt from the ring, then this card immediately comes into play. And let's take a closer look at it. The number one thing that happens is Smeagol, the character, immediately becomes the guide to the Fellowship. It doesn't matter who else is still in it. Now, the main power that he provides is, for the rest of the game, a Smeagol hunt tile that is drawn from the hunt bag counts as a zero, as long as Smeagol is in fact the guide to the Fellowship. And there are ways to get uh, more Smeagol tiles into the hunt bag, effectively being zeros and very beneficial to the Free Peoples. Basically, Smeagol is really good at helping the Fellowship hide. Now, Smeagol won't always be on your side, however, because if he is separated from the Fellowship for any reason, or more interestingly, if the Fellowship is declared in a Free People's stronghold while Smeagol is the leader, well, then this card called Tamed Wretch goes away and is replaced by this card. We shall get it. And the way we shall get it works is this is a shadow card. Now, for the rest of the game, during a hunt for the ring, if you draw a tile, the shadow player can say, eh, you know what, I don't like that tile. I'm going to draw a second tile and apply the effects of the second one. And the first tile, oh, it doesn't leave the game. It goes back in the bag to come out later. So this is basically if Smeagol gets... Uh, upset with the Fellowship, he gets separated or gets declared inside a Free People's Stronghold, Tamed Wretch goes away, We Shall Get It comes out. So having Smeagol as the guide to the Fellowship can help you for a while, but it also might eventually hurt you. The last thing that this expansion adds to the game is sort of an alternate setup called the Council of Rivendell, where they imagine, well, what if some of the companions left Rivendell before Frodo and the Ring Bearer to sort of get their nations activated and roused up against Sauron. So what the game consists of is alternate versions of all the companion cards that during setup, the Free Peoples player can choose certain companions to use their alternate cards or all of them or none of them. It's totally up to them. They don't have to reveal that to the shadow player. Um, now, I will point out that if you want to use Gandalf's special Keeper die, you do have to choose Gandalf's the Grey Keeper of Narya card, as opposed to the card that comes with the game, Gandalf the Grey, the Grey Wanderer. But, once you've decided which versions of the Fellowship Companions you want to use, you shuffle them up and place them in the appropriate spot with only the leader being visible. Now, what are the differences? Well, you'll notice that not all of the cards have a nation symbol on them, meaning they don't just automatically activate certain nations. You can only activate them if you meet the requirements on the card. But the benefit is a lot of these characters will actually start outside the Fellowship. For instance, Meriadoc here um, can start the game in the Shire. Boromir can start in Minas Tirith. Legolas can start 
in the woodland realm, and so on. So it allows them to sort of disperse from the fellowship much faster and potentially get their nations activated. They also have slightly different powers when they uh, stay with the fellowship. For example, uh, Gimli, as the guide during the hunt, if you separate Gimli from the fellowship, you can reduce that hunt damage by one. Uh, a lot of them have that power when they stay and are the guide to the fellowship. So it's just an alternate way to set up the game and have different versions of the characters. Obviously, if you're starting the game with them in their alternate starting locations, you would have to reveal that to the shadow player. And as they became the guide, uh, you would have to reveal them uh, to see what versions are in play. If the Council of Rivendell module is used, then the shadow player gets these two tokens. These tokens are basically like freebie dice. At any point during the resolution of your action dice, the shadow player can turn in this token to move the Nazgul and minions anywhere they want uh, according to their normal movement rules. So it's like a free movement. And also, this token here allows the shadow player to advance uh, one spot on the political track of the nation of his choice. So if the Free Peoples player gets to use the alternate versions of the companions and gets them spread out quickly, then the shadow player gets to advance on the political track more quickly and move his minions around more easily. So there you have it. That's pretty much everything you need to know to play with the expansion The Lords of Middle-Earth to one of my favorite games, War of the Ring. I may have made a few mistakes, I usually do. If you catch any, feel free to put them in the comments. If you like the way I describe these games and teach them, feel free to like and subscribe. Word of mouth is the best way for me to advertise. And if you have any requests, this video itself was because several of my viewers requested that I do the expansions to War of the Ring. So there you go. There's the first one, The Lords of Middle-Earth, the first expansion to the War of the Ring. Enjoy!